Hey everybody, welcome back again. This is Billy with Wolf River Music Television and I wanna welcome you to episode number five. I'm right down here at the intersection of where Lookout Mountain meets Wonderland Avenue and we're about to head right up that road, Lookout Mountain, and we're gonna see some really cool places that are associated with the Mamas and the Papas. We're gonna see a house where other members of the Doors lived together and a little story about Jim Morrison coming over and having a conversation. We're gonna take a look at the spot where Jim wrote some of his most famous lyrics. And then we're also gonna see Carol King's house. It's gonna be awesome, stick around. Okay, so we're on Lookout Mountain and uh, we're approaching the house. I believe it's 8671, which is the house where Michelle Phillips of the Mamas and the Papas was living at the time when she received the letter from the other three members of the group effectively firing her from the Mamas and the Papas. Yep, that would be it right there. 8671 Lookout Mountain. Okay, so just a couple of houses behind me here is the house that Michelle Phillips was living in at the time that she was separated from John Phillips. And that would have been in June of 1966 when she received the letter from the other members of the band, including John, Denny, and Cass. So this would have been where the letter was officially sent that fired Michelle Phillips from the Mamas and the Papas. Right here. So the story goes like this. Before the first Mamas and Papas record had even been completed and released in early 1966, Michelle Phillips who was still married to John Phillips at the time, had what she described as a brief fling with bandmate Denny Doherty while all four of the band members were living together in a house somewhere in Hollywood. I'm not sure if that house was here in Laurel Canyon, but that's irrelevant. Now, John, being the ever pragmatic member of the group, decided to just overlook the affair due to reasons of not wanting the group broken up and disbanded before they even got started over something that was as trivial to him as an affair amongst bandmates. Not only did he overlook the affair, he actually parlayed the entire incident into another hugely successful hit song titled, I Saw Her Again. He then proceeded to taunt Michelle and Denny with the song by revealing to them what the subject matter was all about and then by forcing them to record it and sing it hundreds of times over and over again in the ensuing years at live concerts. A few months after that happened, Michelle had another affair, but this time it was with Gene Clark of the Birds and he decided one night to brazenly show up at a Mamas and Papas show at the Troubadour in June of 1966. And then the two of them, Gene and Michelle, flirted aggressively throughout the entire performance and made it painfully obvious to everyone, including John, what was going on between them. Now this time around, John decided that he couldn't overlook this one especially since it was with a rival musician from a successful group living right here in the neighborhood. According to witnesses, he actually chased Michelle across a parking lot and lit into her after this show. He told her that she was going to be fired from the group. So he consulted a lawyer and he consulted the record label. And then the group, including Denny and Cass, signed and sent an official letter of termination right here to Michelle at this address on Lookout Mountain, effectively firing Michelle from the Mamas and the Papas. They attempted to replace her 
with another look-alike female singer. But when that didn't quite work out, they reinstated Michelle to the group less than two months after this incident happened. And after that, more and even greater dysfunctional drama ensued between all of them over the next few years. But all of that's a different story for a different time. Now at this point, I want to be totally honest with you. I've tried really hard so far to keep most of my controversial type personal opinions to myself. Especially when it comes to something that's judgmental of other people or someone who I've never met. Someone who I never had an opportunity to talk to or understand. But in this particular case, since it does involve John Phillips, I'm going to go ahead and just rip into this one right now. When John Phillips was 25 years old and married with two small children at home in San Francisco, he was seduced by a beautiful young girl, 16 years of age, after a musical performance. He decided then that it would be in his best interest, professionally speaking, of course, to abandon his family in order to not only be with this 16-year-old girl, but also eventually to marry her and to place her into his folk singing trio, The Journeyman. Now, never mind the fact that she had never sung professionally before. He was mainly banking on the idea of her good looks and her ability to attract attention in publicity photographs. And so, who exactly was that 16-year-old girl that we're talking about? Oh yeah, that was actually Michelle Phillips. So in the end, Michelle Phillips was only out of the group for two months, and then she was back. You know, they tried to replace her with a look-alike who couldn't even sing as well as she did. And since that didn't work out, John, being the businessman that he was, knew that the only choice was to just go ahead and swallow his pride and let her back into the band. So, sorry John, if you're no longer here amongst us to be able to defend yourself against these accusations. But in this particular case, knowing by your own admission, in your own autobiography, that you also actually had a model girlfriend on the side at the same time as all of this was going on with Michelle I think you really kinda got what you deserved on this one anyway moving on Okay, so there's a really, really cool story associated with this house that's right here behind me. In the summer of 1967, Robbie Krieger of The Doors and John Dinsmore of The Doors were living right here. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna read just a little part of a chapter from John Dinsmore's book, Riders on the Storm. And he's gonna tell us a really cool story in his own words about an event that took place here involving Jim Morrison and the other two. And we're gonna take a little walk up Lookout Mountain all the way up to Appian Way and maybe just a little bit beyond. And we're gonna talk about Jim and we're gonna talk about the doors on the way up. Los Angeles, May 1967. When Robbie and I were still roommates on Lookout Mountain Drive in Laurel Canyon, Jim came by one afternoon when I was out. Apparently, he was deeply depressed, pacing the floor and saying that everything was up. Robbie was taken by surprise, 
since Jim rarely confided in us about his problems, only his music. After talking for a little while, Robbie suggested that they take a walk up the hill to Appian Way for the spectacular panoramic view of Los Angeles, saying it could be the thing for a little perspective. Half an hour later, Robbie returned, and Jim followed shortly thereafter. He was euphoric. What happened, Robbie asked him. Look at these lyrics, Jim said excitedly. People are strange when you're a stranger. Faces look ugly when you're alone. Women seem wicked when you're unwanted. Streets are uneven when you're down. These are great, Jim. Have you got a melody to go with it? Robbie asked. Jim smiled strangely and hummed a few bars. Robbie's ears immediately perked up. He knew a hit when he heard one. That melody has a nice hook. Yeah, I really feel good about this one. It just came to me all of a sudden, in a flash, as I was sitting up there on the ridge looking out over the city. His eyes were wild with excitement. I scribbled it down as fast as I could. It felt great to be writing again. He looked down at the crumpled paper in his hand and sang the chorus in his haunting blues voice. When you're strange, faces come out of the rain. When you're strange, no one remembers your name. The album Strange Days was released in October 1967 and People Are Strange was finally chosen as the single for its unique sound and hook-filled melody. I wondered if people would notice how vulnerable Jim's lyrics were. The song went top 10 nationally, but at the time, I was disappointed that we didn't reach number one. I was 22 years old, and the feelings of immortality that I had were coupled with the relentless desire for more. Okay, well here we are. This is the point where Lookout Mountain Avenue ends and becomes Appian Way. And if you look at this really awesome looking house right here, 8888 Appian Way, it was built in 1934. And the house right next door to it, which is 8880 Appian Way, has been there since 1949. Now, how do I know that? Because I looked in the Los Angeles County tax records. Why did I look there? Well, because I wanted to know whether or not those two houses were there when Jim walked up here in 1967. And they were. So that means that Jim had to walk a little bit further down the road here to get to the famous lookout where he wrote the lyrics to People Are Strange. And it had to have been right here at the intersection of Appian Way and Cyprian Drive. This would be the view that Jim Morrison saw when he stood here at this spot in May of 1967 and wrote the lyrics to People Are Strange. And the view is still spectacular. There's Hollywood and LA right down there. Now, speaking a little bit more of this house here at 8880, it is obviously going through some kind of renovation. The whole backside of it actually has been completely ripped off. I don't know if it was damaged or if it's just in the process of being remodeled.
Okay, so here we are at 8803 Appian Way. And I had mentioned, I believe in episode two, that this house had originally been owned by actress Mary Astor, who made her mark in the silent film era of the 1920s and the 1930s. The house was built in 1926. And in 1966, it was bought by Denny Doherty of the Mamas and the Papas. And from that point on, it's actually had a very colorful history with a lot of different people and a lot of groups that have come and gone either living in this house, renting it, or else using it for various different purposes while they were staying here in Hollywood. And we'll go through each and every one of those, at least the ones that I'm aware of and that I know of. In 1970, Denny started renting the house out. He lived here for about four years. And the first person that rented the house was Hollywood director Hal Ashby. And he was known for a lot of different things, but he's probably most famous for being the director of the movie Harold and Maud. And he used this house to edit the entire film right here inside. And I believe that a frequent house guest would have been Cat Stevens. Because, of course, if you've seen that movie or you're familiar with it, you'll know that all of the music in the film was done by Cat Stevens. Shortly after that, had to have been the second half of 1972, the Rolling Stones were staying here in the Los Angeles area because at the time they were working on a concert film documentary. So for about six or eight months, they all lived here in this house as well. That film, by the way, was never released because it depicted too many people doing illegal drugs such as cocaine and heroin. In 1979, the house was bought by none other than Waylon Jennings, which may seem a little bit odd, and you may wonder why on earth Waylon Jennings would have wanted to come out here to Laurel Canyon. But if you are familiar with the television show The Dukes of Hazard, then you may remember that Waylon Jennings worked on that show as the narrator doing voiceover work. And since that television show ran from 1979 up until 1985, well, that makes total sense to me why he would have needed to spend some time out here in the Los Angeles area. In the 1990s, the house was either purchased or rented by Marilyn Manson. And the funny thing about that is that he moved out because he believed that there was a poltergeist inside the house. Have you begun to notice a trend that everybody's house here in this area seems to be haunted by something? Well, if the house is haunted bad enough to scare away Marilyn Manson, it has to be haunted pretty badly. Oh, what's going on here? Yeah, don't worry. Everybody here drives backwards. It's just a California thing. No, seriously. I think I mentioned just a few minutes ago that when I first approached the Carroll King house, I didn't recognize it. It's actually kind of hard to see. And so I just walked right past it. I did manage to get a photo of it just because my camera was pointing at it. So I realized what I had done and I wanted to make sure that I knew exactly which house I was looking at. So I walked all the way around and came around to the back side of the house just to make sure that I was matching up the right house with the right address. And I was, so I didn't film myself going down, but I did film myself walking back up. So what you're seeing is the backwards version of me walking back up Apian Way to go back to the Carol King house to the front side. And 
by the way, there's the back side of the Denny Doherty house right there. And just a couple of doors down, here's the Carol King house. Okay, I hate to get really bogged down into minute details about things that are extremely trivial. Actually, I'm kidding. I love this kind of stuff. So, you're gonna have to bear with me, but we're going to talk about the Tapestry album cover and the window, and we're gonna clear up some misconceptions that people have about what part of the house was the window in, whether or not it was even this house that the photos were taken in. I can guarantee you that they were, and I'm gonna give you evidence as to why. Now, I have seen other videos, and I have seen other people speculating about where the famous window is where Carol was sitting with her cat, Telemachus. Yes, that's his name, Telemachus. Now, some people have speculated that the window is on the back side of the house up on the third floor. Incorrect. Some have speculated that this is the window. Others have speculated that no, actually it's this one. And I'm here to tell you that both of those windows are incorrect and all of those theories about the window being on the back side of the house are incorrect. Why? Well, here's why. I want you to take a look at the actual album cover for Tapestry. Here it is. Everybody knows this. Everybody has seen it. It's one of the most iconic photos of the 1970s. It's one of the most iconic album covers of all time. Never mind the fact that it sold close to 30 million copies. Everyone knows this album cover. Now, take a look at this photo. This is not the album cover. This is the uncropped version of that same photo. And I want you to take a very close look right there above the back of the cat. What do you see? It's a fence. There's a fence outside of the window. That should tell you something right there. That window is on the ground floor of this house. It's not on the third floor. Otherwise, you wouldn't see the top of that fence. Also, it means that we're on the very close edge of the property. The closest portion of this house to the property boundary is on the southeast side. Take a look at this Google map photo right here. I know it's hard to tell that that's Carol's house, but it is. It's also the most difficult part of the house to see. It's the most secluded by trees and vegetation. But that is her house behind all of those bushes and trees right there. There's the fence. And here's another photo. If you look right there, kind of close to Carol's foot, right outside the window, you can also see the top of that wooden fence. You have to look really closely, but it's there. Here's another reason why the speculation of these windows on the back side of this house are incorrect. If you look at some of the other outtakes, it's clear that there are four folding sections to this window. And each one of those sections has at least two window panes per row. That means there has to be at least eight small window panes per folding section. You can tell that these windows in question are not big enough to be the actual window. There's not enough window panes for any of these windows back here on this side of the house to be the actual window in question. Now, yes, I do see some of the other larger ones over there on the other side but those are not of the old vintage style. Now, I do also realize that people do remodel homes, but I absolutely cannot imagine that whoever bought this house in recent times, if they found out that one of those windows was the iconic window that Carol King sat next to for the album cover, I would like to think that they would not tear that window out and replace it with something else. They would have to know that that would be a really dumb thing to do, right? Come on. The photographer who took this photo was named Jim McCrary. Now, he's no longer with us. He died in 2012. So he's no longer here to clear any of this up. Plus, he actually confounded the issue. Here's why. He did an interview 
many years ago talking about this album cover. And he claimed that the photos were not even taken in Carol's house on Appian Way. He claimed that the photos were taken about half a mile away at a friend's house on Wonderland Avenue. There's no way that this is correct. I don't care if he is the photographer or not. Also, in the same interview, he undermines his own theory of it being at a house on Wonderland Avenue because of the cat. Here's the deal. The story goes that she was sitting there, right there by the window, and he was taking photos. And then he looked around the room and noticed that Telemachus, the cat, was sitting on a pillow, probably sleeping over on the other side of the room. And for some bizarre reason, he asked, do you think it would be okay if we put the cat in the photo? And it being Carol's cat, she said, yeah, sure. He's fine. Just pick him up and bring him over. Well, what he did was he actually, instead of just picking the cat up directly, he picked up the pillow with the cat on it, brought it over to the little ledge right there that you see that she's sitting on, set the cat down, and that cat was in that position right there for all of probably about three seconds because this is the only photo that he got. He was able to have just enough time to snap one single photo with her and the cat, and then that cat bolted, as they do. So, that's the one that made the album cover right there. Now, here's why I'm telling you that there's no way that this is not Carol's house. Because, look, we have a cat. We don't just randomly take our cat to some other person's house for no good reason especially if there was a photo shoot and she was working and the cat was never planned to be in the photo in the first place. Why on earth would she take her cat to some other person's house for no good reason? So it's obvious that this is her house. I realize it's just a cat, but think about it. You don't just randomly show up at somebody else's house with your cat, right?
Hey, thank you so much for hanging out with us and watching episode five. I want you to come back and join us again for episode six. We're gonna head back down to the bottom and the base of Lookout Mountain, and we're gonna see some really cool things down there. So when we do get to episode number six, we're gonna talk about Mickey Dolenz, who was the drummer for the Monkees, and where he lived. We're gonna talk about David Crosby, and how he met Joni Mitchell and how Joni Mitchell got out here to Laurel Canyon. We're going to talk about Graham Nash and how he met Joni Mitchell and then how Graham Nash met David Crosby and Stephen Stills. It's all about that networking. We're going to talk about Frank Zappa. We're even going to throw in some historical figures like Tom Mix, who was the famous cowboy actor of the silent film era who lived at the property before Frank Zappa. We're even gonna talk about Harry Houdini. Yeah, that's right. So you don't wanna miss this one. It's gonna be cool. And as always, please remember to subscribe to our channel so you will always know when new videos are coming out. Again, this is Billy with Wolf River Music Television, and I want you to have a great day. See you next time. <laughs>